Kyle, my friend, we are live or we're recording. How are you? I'm great, Sonny. How are so, you? I, I'm, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I had a, a nice day. Took the kitties out to just, I don't know, out. We <laughs> went to Walmart. <laughs> We've got a toy. That's, that seems to be, I don't know, a regular occurrence. So what is, what are we up to? I wanted to give people a bit of context before we jump into it. I've, I did what, like 120 some interviews, right? Bitcoin stories interviews. You were obviously one of the people that I interviewed and I taken a little break, maybe about a month or two off from that. I'm pretty busy with work and all that. But as I rise out of my slumber, I've been thinking a lot and thinking a lot about current events and just like what's happening in the world. And so you and I, we've been talking as well. And so we've been friends for, when did we meet Kyle? 20, I feel like- We, we met at the money right, show. Right. We talked about that. We're going to have- 2015. <laughs> okay. So six years ago. And you know, I was saying like the more and more uh, recently, especially as I talked to you, I started to realize like, whoa, we're just, like- insanely aligned on a lot of things and i've been itching to try and do content that's not just me interviewing people but more talking right or but it's like talking to the camera is a bit awkward and so wouldn't it be nice to talk about current events what's happening in the world unfolding seemingly complex matters and hopefully shining some light on it and i thought this format where two friends just shooting the shit would be ideal so thanks for uh, you know joining me on this uh, journey absolutely <laughs> And our goal here is to just have free flowing, speak our truths, discuss topics du jour, talk about crypto, but also talk about tyranny, totalitarianism, and what we can do, what is happening, what people are saying, provide a little bit of context because we know that there is a whole spin factory out there working full time, incredibly well funded to paint the narrative that the world is this and fits nicely in their little tube box. And we are here to just speak our truths. And the wonderful thing is in the year 2021 is anybody can be a broadcaster. Let's broadcast, bro. Yeah, let's let's start creating content and sharing our views because we've been in the industry a long time. I was part of, I was following like, you know, the 9-11 truth kind of movement since 20, 2003, 4, 5. I think Loose Change was like the first, wow, what is going on here? And I remember when Zeitgeist came out in 2007, that one like was like, whoa, Okay. Yeah. Huge, yes. Huge. Nine eleven. Total BS. Yeah. And then it got into part three, the men behind the curtains, and it started exposing the central bank like BS, mm. and then which segued into Ron Paul and end the Fed and gold as a store of value. And then Bitcoin came along, and initially, I don't know about you, but initially I was like, this is stupid, <laughs> just dismissed it. But then further we just rolled, and, and then I had my awakening to Bitcoin, and it's been gosh, almost eight years now of working like full on on crypto. And yeah, and then I guess two years ago or like 18 months ago or whatever, 20 months ago, Corona bullshit started happening. And now we are deep in what was two weeks to flatten the curve has now turned into a year and a half and a full segregation of society. And I would kin it to society is being primed for genocide if not it's if it's not actively you know taking place right now there's my little opening Oof. monologue if yeah no you kind of went into the deep end there right near the end and i was hoping to work work our way towards that topic it is what it is it is what it is okay so shit's going down right shit's going down there's a lot of stuff happening, like you said. I think it's interesting that you started with the 9-11 thing because when I think about my life, almost what, like four decades on earth, just over four decades, I see that that moment when that happened as being just something that it was like a, it was a blip in the matrix. So it was like just something that didn't fit the rest of what was happening in the world. And it seemed way out of place, but it made you question so many things. And it had this overarching like impact right on all of our lives whether it be travel or just like everything and then i would say the other kind of major blip in the matrix has been this coronavirus thing and it just felt a bit out of place and didn't really know where it was coming from and and it's been what 18 months dude 18 months I, like in the past i'm not gonna lie like people ask me about covid and i'd be like i'm just bored of it like, i don't even want to talk about it but recently in the last few months especially 
I've gotten really interested in this COVID thing. And I've started to think how this is something that's impacting everybody I know, right? Their lives in, in, in a negative way. And it, it just almost feels like everyone's resigned to the fact that it's just bigger than them. You know what I mean? And, and that's what got me to start going, wait, no, hold on. Bitcoin, if it's taught me anything, it's that there's nothing bigger than money, I guess you could say. The fact that we were so uh, curious about this revolution and willing to face. Remember, I know those videos of you like way back in the day with Andreas and all these guys like in the government, like telling them about Bitcoin and how it's a future. So we had to face a lot of slack because of that. And so in many ways, I feel like what's about to come for you and I in terms of the tsunami of potentially, we're going to get a lot of haters. I feel like we're ready for it because we've walked through that in the past. And now I think both you and I see a different truth than maybe what's being presented out there. Okay, that's a lot of just gobbledygook. <laughs> I just thought I'd, thought I'd get it out there. So one thing, I, one thing I was hoping to do is, is again to keep this fun, to go back and forth between conversation and current events. But I, I, I was thinking, what better place than Twitter, really, to, to maybe you know, <laughs> I, I capture a lot of what's going on in real time, but also also talk about current events. So th this is the quote that I put up there, by the way, a few days ago on my Twitter uh, header here, which is the the best defense is a good offense. <laughs> I can't help but feel that my and we're going to go through all the craziness that's going on with COVID and all this weirdness. Look, by the way, this is my tweet that I was referring to earlier. Same energy. <laughs> Mayor Humdinger. <laughs> Anyways, we'll get to that. Yeah, 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 yeah. So like I said, the best deep. Oh, did, it, did my screen come through for you or no? Let me see what happened here. I just did a bit of uh, screen sharing. Uh, oh, yes. Yeah, so, and, and my wife called me and I'm wondering what's going on. You want me to pause it for sure. a few seconds or? Just, just pause for one. Okay, we're back. So what was I saying? So I was saying is we're going to do a combination of us just chatting, maybe doing a bit of screen sharing and going back and forth between current events and just storytelling. And people should also keep in mind, we're not doctors. So this isn't medical advice. This isn't financial advice. This is literally two friends just talking about their opinions on things. So it's going to get, it's going to get interesting. So Kyle, where, where do we go? So I, I like how you, I like how you level set with, okay, 9-11, because like I said, that was a bit of a blip in the matrix. So was COVID, but in between something called Bitcoin came and that was a bit of a, a red pill, orange pill moment where you started to see through the blips, you started to see through the matrix. And for the first time in my life, at least things started making sense where, I don't know, I don't know if you, if this makes sense to you, but like for the longest time, I always felt like everything's connected, but I just couldn't connect it myself. Like I couldn't figure out how it's connected. I just could feel that everything was connected. And when I say everything, I mean like health, finance, like just everything, right? Whether it's environment, whether it's the energy crisis or uh, the, the poverty crisis, all these crises and things that we think, to me, I always in my heart kind of felt it's all the same. There's something that's wrong. And like I said, is for a long part of my life, it was actually money that I was trying to dispel and trying to figure out. Prior to that, health. Obviously I don't talk about it because I'm like more an engineer and an entrepreneur, but like I spent a lot of time thinking about health. Like what does health mean to me and how do I approach health? Because and, and I think these are all things that maybe people think about, maybe people don't. But anyways, my, my, my kind of bigger point here is that everything is connected and I've had now glimpses into feeling like, you know what, whether it's, like I said, Bitcoin, whether it's meditation, whether it's just all these like little things in my life that I have that make me, give me this superpower to see through all the bullshit. And, and so part of my cannabis, I would say, so part of my goal is to, to at least again, bring our truth to the world. And it's going to be, like I said, a bit messy. It's going to be all over the place. And, but I think that's, that'll be part of the fun too. And I think <laughs> once we get a little formula going and I yeah. will echo as well, like Bitcoin was like a huge opportunity to show me that there was some hope with regards to disrupting the cancer that was the central banks on, on civilization. Many people also worry that it's also a dystopia tech. I share those beliefs as well. It has the potential to enslave as much as it has the potential to free. We're on like a fine knife's edge. If we lose control of self-custody wallets, we're like, and we're first to play in with cryptocurrency as the underlying factor, but we're operating like that represents new currency. We're still forced to use the big centralized custodial institutions, whatever. That's another topic for discussion. Mm. But again, and then digital identity was another space that I was really interested in. Now it's like vaccine passports. I was like, God, ah. yeah, technology, that technology <laughs> could absolutely be used for that. 
but it can also be used for enabling us to reclaim our health data, to exactly. be able to be in control of all of our data, to not trust Google, Facebook, the government, our doctors with our data. We can reclaim it. And while COVID might be like super darkness, it's also super light in this because this represents a period of chaos where the world is getting shaken up. And out of this shaking, like I believe we're going to sit, settle into a sacred pattern and we can start really merging into this golden age. Some people have called it a diamond age. I think it's a golden age, diamond age, whatever. It's going to be better. The world before like the old normal, if you will, was a little bit manic and a little bit crazy. And I think a lot of the world has gone through a lot of self-reflection, meditation, and an understanding. And there's been more and more people waking up to the inner workings of, of the powers that be and the corporatocracy and the World Economic Forum, Klaus Schwab, Great Reset, all these, the power that big pharma in combination with big media and big tech, the power that they hold in controlling the elus the illusory matrix you know, that is being programmed via the television and the channels on the televisions and the programs on television. So anyways, we are creating our own program here. <laughs> Start um, like discussing some of these things and encouraging uh, people to continue to ask questions, always ask questions. Don't make assumptions based on the words of others. Don't take things personally. If anything we say affects, it is not, we're not trying to be personal with any, with our regards to anyone. We aim to be impeccable with our words and we're just trying to do our best in figuring out, you know, how can we make a difference and, and discuss amongst, amongst friends and utilize freedom of speech and the power of assembly, albeit this is digital assembly, but heck yeah. Thank you for doing that. One of the things we want to do is let's just like roll through Twitter. Let's take a look at your Twitter. Let's go through some of them. Let's just comment on it. Let's have some fun. I want to do that. And by the way, this is going to be something hopefully we do regularly, right? Like I said, I was I'm, part of what I'm looking forward to is not having to like, uh, we, we're just going to have fun with it. But before we get into our view, worldview, Kyle, I think, and if you don't want to do this, we could not, but I think what might help is, have you heard that famous saying, seek first to understand then to be understood. Steve Cuffey, you got the seven habits of highly effective people. Um, okay. One of my favorite books. So for seek first to understand, then to be understood. So I feel like if we go, I think you've already, and we've, I've already alluded a little bit in terms of like where we sit with all of this, but what if we had to spend just a few minutes to try and speak to what people, cause like right now you, you gotta get, you gotta understand that talking about this stuff is way out of most people's like kind of view, right? Worldview. It's just, what are these guys even talking about? Blips in the matrix, pharmacy, pharmaceutical power, this, that. So I want to first do a level set. So if my worldview is created by the news that I watch. If the only thing I do is listen to the government officials that, you know, are in my country, if all I do is prescribe to the little nuggets of information that, that the pharmaceutical companies provide me, there is a narrative that is out there. And what is that narrative first? What is it? So what happened 18 months ago? Let's say we're watching this movie now. Let, let's years go from over. Now, what, what the fuck's going on? What I mean, is the official narrative? The official narrative yeah, is that, that there first. is is a hyper deadly coronavirus that has been morphing into different variants and that it was going to be so deadly that we needed to declare a global pandemic and then like we ha had to protect ourselves and by and we saw that china it started in china was where it first came from and china they did a great job of locking all their people down and they showed footage of people collapsing flat over in the streets and then we started seeing based from in the news we started seeing these headlines that bodies are piling up in the streets and be very afraid everyone's oh my gosh and then at the same time like all the world's media at the same time started reporting the same news over and over again, telling us how dangerous and how scary this thing was. We need to be really afraid. And they also said in the very beginning too, that we got to be afraid and we got to protect ourselves. We got to lock down. We got to do things like social distancing, because when you come together with another person, you're dangerous. And according to the narrative, you, Sonny, are a 
danger to society. By being out there, by interacting with other people, you are dangerous. You don't even need to have symptoms either. Dangerous, no matter what, because we don't know. It could take 14 days. Like 14 days was this big new, this new thing. And if you, and if, and we have this amazing way of knowing whether or not you have it, and it's called a PCR test or it's the COVID test. And by sticking this piece of plastic up into your brain and swiping it or really close to your brain, then they take it out and then they send it to the lab. And then it comes back with either a positive or a negative. And if you're positive, you have COVID. And then in the beginning, you had to go into 14 days of isolation as a thing. And we had to help prevent the spread. We started putting all the spyware into people's phones as well. And we, and to, in order to con, into order to trace the contacts that you had called contact tracing so that you, we'd be able to know if you were in touch with other people, just in case you were to get this extremely deadly disease. And it turned out that a lot of people got you know, COVID according. There are a lot of people tested positive from this test and the test continues to be done today. And on, on the headlines, the, the media tells you how many cases there are of COVID on a constant basis. And then that was for the first, what was that? That was for the first about 10 months until the vaccines came in. And the vaccines- Wait, the, the two weeks to flatten the curve. What was that? Remember that, that was- can't remind be, me. Like, I, I remember something about two weeks flattening the curve. And now exactly, we, of course. And we didn't want to overwhelm the ICUs. Like forget was that, right? The, of course. And that was the initial, mm -hmm. you need to stay in for two weeks. You need to like make sure you don't go out into society. And we got people ready for this and use this. We canceled the schools and we're gonna we're gonna shut down the schools. We're gonna move to online learning. And it just so happens that like everything was set up to be able to move to online learning pretty quickly, even though it was a total train wreck for any parents out there who had children who were for especially young children as I have. Anyways, but that's I, I, I digress. This was two weeks to flatten the curve. They shut it down, they locked it down. We were all wearing masks. Masks too. In the beginning, it was like masks aren't useful, but then it was like, oh, you know what? Masks are useful. Everybody wear a mask. No mask, no service. It's really dangerous if you're not wearing a mask. You don't want to be able to see people's faces. Like, oh, what happened here? And and it continued. And and so that was the beginning. And then it just kept coming because the testing. They kept running these tests, and according to the media, the tests, the people, it came in waves, and there were people getting sick, and, and there were people who were dying with it, and we kept hearing all these bad stories. They would, the, the, the news would show us these some really bizarre cases, but we also saw these hot spots of like Italy and New York City, where it was like totally crazy, and people were dying left, right, and center. And, and it just, it, this, is, this was the, the foundation of it. And at the beginning, and it was all towards this, at some point, there's going to be a vaccine. And if you've ever watched a movie like Contagion or World War Z or Outbreak, the vaccine is always the solution. It just makes the most sense. There's some sort of the vaccine, what, what we need to be healthy and overcome this. So they started working furiously trying to like at a record pace get a vaccine out for this super deadly virus that we should be terribly afraid of and they were able to start getting into people's arms within about six months of it being discovered or COVID appeared which was a testament to how incredible the these vaccine companies are and the big and the pharmaceutical industry is and and then they rolled through Trump tried to tried his best but Trump was a terrible man and, and can never trust him and everything he said was really dangerous and they shouldn't have trust the vaccine under Trump but now that we're past Trump it's all good we can trust the vaccines they have they got emergency youth author emergency authorization, meaning they didn't have to get full, they didn't have to go through all the, the rigors of traditional testing, of traditional vaccine, a drug approval, they go, because it was an, because it is, it was, oh no, sorry, it is, it still is an emergency. We don't need to hold ourselves to the high, the rigorous scientific safety standards that are in place for new drugs, especially a drug like that is, is, is holding, that is using never before seen technology to combat the coronavirus. That is like where this narrative lied. I, I think it's total bullshit. I think it's complete bullshit, and I highly encourage everybody to research Event 201, which was like we should, which we should mention, because in October of 2019, John Hopkins University, the World Economic Forum, 
and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation mm -hmm. held a three-day symposium in New York City where they role-played a global coronavirus pandemic. And it featured, like, not, I wouldn't call it fake news, but they had senior CNN producers and journalists doing simulation broadcasts about what would happen. And it was all geared towards the vaccine as the solution. And then they came out with seven recommendations and you can go through them all. And, it, and, and it was, this was the recommended global plan. And it include, included information warfare by flooding the zone, which is what we saw when the number of coronavirus articles and fear propaganda started spreading like wildfire all global media channels across all blue check marks starting pushed out like absolutely mad. And then it also talked about misinformation and censoring disinformation or misinformation, what they categorized as misinformation and using their tech partners. And lo and behold, here we are 18 months later, if you mention the word vaccine in a post, up comes a little bullshit bar that sends you to like the CDC's website or the World Health Organization's website. If you're talking about a myriad of things, because this is a very deep issue, there's so many different facets and angles and both real misinformation, real disinformation, but then there's also impassioned scientists and doctors who are simply asking questions and they're getting censored and canceled, and blackmailed, and threats. I know they're seeing their livelihood being taken away from them. And yeah, it's, it's, it's really devolved. And here we are. And we've now seen two documentaries. Well, the, the big documentary was Pandemic 2 that really outlined, you know, how this shit long in the makings, this wasn't, this didn't come about, this wasn't just a natural happen, happenstance occurrence, just as 9-11 was not just an, a, a random happenstance occurrence. These are, were long, carefully planned operations. Event 201 specifically was at least two or three years in the making to get it to that full production value event. All, it's all recorded as well. You can watch it all. You can see the insanity of these people. And now, if I, mean, I remember in the very beginning, Beginning, like ringing alarm bells about that. And I just got this same argument back that it's just a, it was just a tabletop exercise, the standard operating procedure. And I say bullshit to that. Okay. So that, I think that's a great point. And I have seen that. And that's interesting. A couple of things. Okay. So I want to, I want to hone in on one thing. So this two weeks to flatten the curve. If I, again, recall, it was all about, we're going to overwhelm the ICUs. We can't have that happen. So because we can't have overflow the ICUs, Everybody's got to stay home. Everyone's got to not do their business. Everyone's got to just figure the shit out. But we're just essentially not allowed because the ICUs are going to get overwhelmed. One thing I found a bit funny is, is the why was there, at least in Canada, never any talk about extending the capacity of the ICUs? Or like an, doing like just normal things that your brain might say you do if you're going to have a problem. Like, why would our solution automatically go towards everyone's locked down indefinitely forever and not allowed to? earn money or feed themselves or whatever. It's, is there even a precedence for that? It, it seemed a bit out of the blue. I've been reading a lot about pandemics in the past and shit so, and, and how we tackled it. No, The only precedence for that was literally like, as we witnessed from China, of that's what they did. Exactly. And so they playbook. beat it. Yeah. And they beat it. So it was like, oh, the rest of the world, let's just do what China did. Um, let's talk about China, man. Because and I want to talk a little bit about worlds prior to this going down. I want to say something. Trump, okay. Just for the record, okay. I, I don't, love or hate Trump. Okay. He's just a guy that I've grown up seeing on TV. I'm not going to lie. He's pretty freaking funny. You know, you're fired. <laughs> like I grew up seeing that shit, but I wouldn't say I grew up having disdain for the man. Okay. He's on TV. He does a show where it's about business and I like business. So like how many shows is there about business? Not none. Okay. Anyways, he decides whatever it was five years ago that he's going to run for the being becoming the president of the United States. I was in Houston with my parents at the time. And you know that famous scene where he comes down the elevator, I, I saw that. And I think a day or two after that, I said, that man is the future president of the United States. And it was really bad. My, I won't mention who, but my family, <laughs> some members started to stop talking to me. They're like, no, oh, like people would literally have a short circuit because most people just cannot stand for one reason or another that man. But why am I bringing him up? One thing that I found a bit surprising, there was a lot of things that he said that were just like, huh? Like, what? Oh, well, that makes sense. <laughs> but one of them, one of the things was he started calling out China. 
And like I said, I've been around for some time and I've never seen or heard a politician in my lifetime call out China. Do you know what I mean? So that was a little bit like, I don't know, a little bit of a blip in the matrix. And it was very interesting to, again, I wasn't deep into the weeds with politics and all that three, four years ago. You, everyone would hear about what was happening. So there was a trade war going on. There was this thing with Huawei and Canada got caught in the middle of that. And then you started seeing Hong Kong. I don't know if you remember, just soon before, shortly before the pandemic, there was riots in the street because of Hong Kong and what's happening there. And you started to start, you started to see the first instances of where the, like the two powerful entities in the world, the United States and China were butting heads, but in a way that it didn't affect me or like us. It was just like this thing that was going on in the news. But I think it is noteworthy. Why? Because some of the things that came out of that and eventually, like you said, was related to China. Where am I going with this? Where am I going with this? I don't know, Kyle. I don't know. I just thought that it was important to at least make note of the fact that, I, where am I going with? Look, one of my theses, and again, it's just a thesis, right? Is that we are in the middle of a war. Okay, and it's not a war right now of guns and and bombs. It's a war of ones and zeros. It's, it's an information. It's an information warfare. Like Alex Jones was right, unfortunately, to a large extent. World War Three is an information war, and it's a guerrilla information war. Being there's no division between civilian and military, and that was what Marshall McLuhan you know, spoke about. The great Canadian. And we've read about wars. We've read about the Cold War. We've seen all the movies about, you know, remember like, oh, like anti-communism. And but like when you think back to the world before we came into it, you get this sense that people had woken up to the fact that communism effing evil, like it was bad. But there was this sense that we had triumphed over it. But then this narrative around China and everything brought that back. And, and again, because I'm, I'm trying to do this like episode more along the lines of we're going to be 20 years down the road watching this, trying to like figure out where, where we were and what we were thinking. And I want to make sure I capture some of these things. But again, China over the course of my lifetime has not been seen as an adversary. And by the way, just for the record, I love all Chinese people. I eat Chinese food at least twice a week. I, <laughs> I got great walls. Great. I got no beef with, with Chinese. I've got so many friends that are Chinese. I do have beef with, with communism, right? <laughs> it seems a bit. Yeah. Different. And it's more than just communism. This is like totalitarianism. This is, there's no, there, the citizens don't have freedom of expression, freedom of, or any participation within, you know, the government. It is, this is totalitarianism. Mm. And so it's, yeah, I have so to You started too. this off with tyranny and totalitarianism. Like that was your initial sentence, right? Like at the, when we started this talk today. So do you want to maybe define what do you mean by that? Because we hear that, right? Tyranny, tyranny. Oh, it's tyrannical. Oh, Trump is the tyrannical. Oh, this guy's tyrannical. But what is it? Like, what is tyranny? What is the history? When I think of like shit going bad, you think of like Hitler, right? Like World War II. Well, I don't think most people even know though. Like what, what is, yeah, what, are, what are we complaining about here? Ended. Great question, Sonny. And I don't, I'm not going to pull up the definition of what is or tyranny means, but it mean, from my perspective, what it means to me is that the individual mm -hmm. no longer has, like his rights are lost. The constitution is lost. Our Canadian charter of rights and values doesn't apply anymore. Like the law that we have in place to protect our citizens is overthrown. The ability for the government to like enact laws on itself or the rulers to enact laws they can do in absence of any participation from the public and and be able to enforce like dictates on the population be it something specifically like very dour sunny in a vaccine mandate you must get them you must get the vaccine or you can't sit on the train next to a vaccinated person. So you're in danger of continuing that, that narrative. And that goes against, that just goes against the Nuremberg Code, that goes against our charter rights, that goes against like basic human decency laws. So it's, it's, and this is, and, and from this perspective, there's that article that I mentioned before, Mob Mentality and the Unvaxxed, which expresses and, which, and pontificates that we are heading down a nasty road where the uns are being positioned as as a pollution in society that needs to be cleansed and that this segment of society is being viewed as assholes and filth and death eaters and they're selfish right wing like extremists like almost the point of terrorists and when you talk to the unvaxxed or 
anti-vaxxers or the vaccine hesitant or the straight up refusers and those who are like asking, then just simply asking questions about this. Why? Why? Is one of the best questions like in the beginning, but that that strays from what is tyranny and totalitarianism basic question. And I think we're starting to see it when you have when the will of the few is being imposed on the many and there's no recourse and there's no mechanisms for accountability, transparency, responsibility and justice to be served. When, when segments of the population are being punished, ostracized, defunded, demoralized, dehumanized, super dangerous. And that is, a, is, a, is evidence of tyranny and totalitarianism taking shape. And I think we should go to that clip of Justin from, that you posted on Twitter, to be honest. We, we, can. Let's, we can do that. I can actually look it up here. But hold on, wait, wait, dude, I, know, I think we're on a good trip, though, here with, with all this. Okay, let's talk about the pink elephant in the room, right? Which is what? That, yes, that, that we are being, if you choose to not take the jab, <laughs> the jeba, then you are essentially a criminal. Like, you are dirt. You're worse than scum of the earth. But I want to, let's maybe focus in on that specific comment, which is what? Sure. Which Okay, so you're saying maybe just play that video. Let me see. Well, pull that video up and play that video. Here, but... here, here. Lovely. I found it. If you, oh, I found it. I found it. I found it. Okay, are you ready for this? So I, I, I think it should come through. So I'm going to share a screen here. So let's dive into the, the deep end here. Share a screen. Can you, can you hear this in three, two, one? You deserve better. You deserve a government that's going to continue to say, get vaccinated. And if you don't want to get vaccinated, that's your choice. But don't think you can get on a plane or a train beside vaccinated people and put them at risk. We need to be strong in the decisions we're taking going forward. And we need to put people first, which we have always done. And I'll be honest, like I do, there's lots of people out there who don't agree with that. And the reality is, that's okay. We're in a democracy. People can make themselves heard. And that's part of why we need to have this moment for people to make that choice for the future. The counter to tyranny is democracy, is elections. And that's exactly what we're putting forward because we have put Canadians at the forefront of everything we've done. And we know that's what we're going to continue to do. So I need you, all of you, all right, that's enough. Okay, wow. There's so much good stuff in there. Actually, if you go back to the Twitter too, yeah. go back to the Twitter and then click on like the original tweet because there's a really wonderful reply to it of showing the other side of what he's looking at. Wait, what do you mean? Wait, wait, wait. Like, let's look at the crowd who he's talking to. No, but how do I find thing. that? You click on the pundit class thing and then you're saying there's a tweet there that- It's a, it's a reply to that tweet. Yeah, I'm looking for it. It's going to be- uh, Before I share a stream, it'll be fun, good to find it. I don't see it though in there. Well, well keep in mind, like I just put this some random person on Twitter. Oh, I know, I know. I, I saw that too. Or if you want to and... share it, go right ahead. So I want to say a couple of points though. So he says a couple of things. The answer to tyranny then is democracy. So is he admitting that everything that's happened over the last 18 months is tyrannical? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and yeah, that's what it sounds like. Okay, and it yeah, also ahead, sounds ahead, like by by him winning the election, it will not be tyranny. That will be democracy. Mm, mob rule, like, democracy. So I have a question. The Another kind of underlying, I guess, subtle point is that for those who don't know, is you are half brothers, right? So you grew up with, I guess, going back and forth with, with Justin on, on. It must have been fun to debate him growing up. That's all I can say. No, I mean, when we, we grew up like challenging each other and being competitive mm. in a lot of sports and a lot of outdoors and canoe trips, but it was never really politics. Like we never got into politics. And when, when I started giving a damn about politics and like asking questions, it was clear that there was a mega divide and mm. that we couldn't actually have real debates on it. And, and then I saw, and then, and in the beginning of COVID, I, I, I when I was aiming to, to participate in my and assist and it was like clear very clear that my assistance was not sought after or welcome so here all right give me this share screen yeah i'm gonna give you share screen wait, wait before i give it over to you though one more thing is, is the other subtle point in there was that he says if you're unvaccinated i'm not gonna allow you to risk getting the vaccinated sick but wait if you're vaccinated aren't you by definition immune to the disease 
So that means he's also admitting the vaccinated aren't really immune to anything because they can catch it supposedly. Exactly. There's so many things, but it's not even a vaccine. Exactly. If you actually go to, or if anybody goes to Wikipedia and looks up the definition of a vaccine, it's something that prevents the actual disease. It actually, but whereas everything we're talking about now is about treating the symptoms. Okay. And I actually have some concerns around that in the sense that if I'm unvaccinated, okay, Kyle, and I go and get COVID, me and you and everybody in the world will know that I potentially have COVID. Why? Because I'm showing symptoms. So now I can isolate. But by getting rid of the symptoms, and by, by the way, Fauci last week admitted, and everyone's now saying that people who are vaccinated are as, the, their ability to spread the virus is as likely as somebody who's not vaccinated. But doesn't that mean that people who are vaccinated are super spreaders because they're people who now don't show symptoms, but they can still catch the disease, spread the disease. So, so in, what's the point? What is the point? How possibly bro, defend and, this? And, and, and I know nobody's going to care about this, but for six months now, the gentleman, there's a French dude, okay, who is a Nobel Nobel laureate. He's like one, this guy discovered HIV. Okay. This guy, I should be, I could show you the video, but this guy, he's been saying for almost six, seven months now that there's something called ADE, which is people who take the vaccine can potentially be the ones who create the Delta variants and all the variants. So doesn't that mean that the vaccinated should be quarantined? I remember I, I heard that the vaccinated weren't being welcome to weren't being welcome for blood donations because they're basically walking experiments. We don't know. There's a lot of like and, I've heard through multiple bro, don't channels you remember as well. Science? You remember science, right? There's something called a control group. Aren't we the fucking control? If we're not vaccinated, we are the control group, but they're somehow making us to be the experiment. And also if you're understand yourself, there's jabbing like, yourself with something and we're not, we are the control. You are not. And you're the guinea pig. Also know that like mm -hmm. in a in, in a trial, which this is the largest trial that's ever taking place. The whole world is the sample size right now, except for those of us who just won't take it. But even within those who have taken it, there is an amazing, I believe, I like it's my like serious belief that there is a huge amount of placebo going out as well. So people are getting vaccinated with nothing, with saline. And they're, but where's the accountability? Like I should be, we should be able to verify that statement, fact check that statement, but verify that with data because you, I just know that. That's in the news. That's in the news that they literally, there was in the news that, oh, we accidentally gave a couple thousand people selling instead of the actual vaccines. You got to come back and take it. Exactly. I, I read it. It's public. There's, so and there's likely a code. There's likely an understood code too, towards which ones are, which ones And let's also are. tease apart this anti-vaxxer comment because i think i'm i'm maybe perhaps moving more towards that camp but i'm i don't think I, I, i'm not an anti-vaxxer meaning i was jabbed as a kid like i've had all my vaccines and i wasn't like freaking out like you six months ago about this vaccine i was just thinking everyone else oh yeah that's the obvious solution <laughs> but then as i started peeling back the onion and started thinking about things from first principles right like actually reading the fine print and trying my best to connect the dots things just didn't seem to add up. And, and, you know, and I'm all about in engineering. The one class that I did well in is statistics. <laughs> in fact, my professor told me, she said, Sunny, you should seriously consider becoming a professor in, in statistics. So that was always one class that I paid attention in. I always loved like the whole thing of probabilities and all that. But let's peel back the onion. You were telling this whole story about what the narrative is out there. Who's dying from COVID? Are people your age and my age are they dying in like droves? Is it something, is it an act? No. So when I look at the, the statistics and like the government data, first of all, between the ages of zero and 20, I almost fell off my chair. In Canada, I think it was less than 30 or 40 or 20 or something like that number of people that died. And even that is- It's like, even lower than that. It's, it's basically zero. It's like five or something. I, I'm just highballing it so that people are going to fact check me and they're going to find something. But it's statistically, it was like almost zero, if not zero. There was a study even from John Hopkins, like two weeks ago, they did, I don't even know, 70, 80,000 kids. And there was like literally none of them, even if they got COVID would die for sure. So when you look at, so who is dying? Okay. If from my understanding, it's not even people in their sixties, it's people in their nineties that have two comorbidities, which is a fancy way of saying they have two other things that might already cause them to die and people that are obese. So, so isn't that a, isn't that a very, I don't know, like 
Anyways, what I'm trying to say is that when there's this fear mongering around, like, oh, there's this pandemic and everybody's dying. I, I don't know. Are they? Like, look at the numbers and look at what's actually happened. And then there's all these other things that have come out in the news. And part of my goal of, of us doing this show and talking about this stuff is because I know people don't have time. They're too busy with work. Everybody I talk to, ah, I don't have time for this. I want to bring together some of these different points so that people can start connecting the dots. But lots of things. So number one, the PCR test, right? The guy who invented the PCR test. So it's not, oh, Sonny said. You can look it up yourself. The guy who invented the PCR test is, is this thing is bogus. You can crank it up to over 40 or 45 and it'll test yes for everything. And now even the CDC and all these guys have said, yep, yep, the PCR test is actually doesn't work. But wait, hold on. For the last year and a half, you've locked us down based on this PCR test. It's predicated on this PCR test. Everything. And now they're like, Every, oh, it doesn't work. And now nah. they say, no, now, <laughs> exactly. And so now it doesn't work. So what's going to be the new test? Tell us, CDC, what's going to be the new test to detect the virus that may never have ever been isolated or even understood. Please, sirs, tell us. And then you're talking about the deaths. Who are the people that are dying? It's literally, Sonny, you're sick. You're going, you're going in, you're dying. They give you a test. You test positive for it. They take it in the back. They spin it up to 45 on the cycle meter. And boom, positive test. You then die of a, you know, a heart attack or old age or whatever. COVID death because like, you had COVID. COVID. Now we're of that stat that's showing up on the right side of this news telecast in big letters, big numbers, a very scary font telling you to be afraid because you could be next of dying of old age and having it blamed as COVID. So it's completely bananas. And now let's get, uh, let's ask for some more data here. You want to dispel this stuff? Tell me how many people under the age of 70 have died from the vaccine? How many people under the age of 20 have died from the vaccine? I'm pretty sure there's probably been one person a day dying from the vaccine under 20. Like, I don't know, that's pure hypothesis. But if, this is the other challenge is like, these guys will not report. They're like, the doctors are being pressured to not report the adverse effects. There was a great example of a doctor was his name? Dr. Hoffey, Christopher Hoffey in, in, in British Columbia, who gave out 900 doses and I like to a largely native community or indigenous community in, in, in rural British Columbia and was like, yo, damaged this, like really messed up a bunch of the people here. Two people have died. We're experiencing serious things. Like I've got some major issues. Please tell me, should I continue administering these doses? And like the official response back was like, keep administering the doses and shut up about any of this you don't talk about this you don't talk about the vaccine the the, the dangers of the vaccine side effects and he got a gag order put on him and um, anyways he can continue to step you up know, it's so it's the open reporting system so i don't know a lot of people oh this is not but this is something that's by the cdc right like uh, it's on the cdc's but it's collected by the cdc so when you talk about debts after taking the vaccine this is what's reported on the government website. This is just in the United States alone. 571,000 <laughs> reports, 12,000, almost 13,000 deaths, Kyle. Yeah, um, and let's get the age breakdown of all these deaths too. Like, this where's is from that the data? Yes, and give yes, us the exactly. breakdown of the age of the age. This miscarriages. 16,000 permanently disabled insanity, right? Life-threatening, 13,000 life-threatening, severe and, and allergic reactions. I have allergies to peanuts and shit, dude. I'm deathly afraid of this thing. Yeah. And people okay. who study this much more suggest that this represents about 10% of the- Harvard. You know, of, Har of people, as the Harvard study was done 10 years ago, and they said that only 10% of cases get reported to VAERS. And I would consider these times to be very different in normal times. So it could be, some people say 1% is only being, oh God, 2% is being reported. What are you showing here? COVID safe rally. So, so this was, that was that speech that Justin gave. And this was who he was speaking to. They put circles on the ground. This is so ridiculous. This is so ridiculous. And there's nobody here. This is, this is going to, this, I swear, this is going to look exactly like Biden's bullshit camp campaign where there were no people at any rallies and then he wins incredible majority and one of the other things is like this is why we have democracy it's like, okay are we gonna have like incredible transparency and election integrity within this it was just announced that there's gonna be up to five million million votes in a country of 30 in the country of 35 million people five million mail-in votes, given that there has been a lot of documented issues regarding mail-in voting, regarding closed source systems that account for these things. Yo, like, I don't trust it. And I don't trust that. I don't trust that his, his answer to tyranny is 
democracy is 5 million mail-in votes. Just don't trust that. Don't trust them with we're seeing. I just saw a, a clip out of out of California of like people going because it's a recall election going on down here. And I've seen people like going up to apartment buildings with like master mail keys, opening them up and pulling out all the mail in ballots, pulling out them all like ballot harvesting, as they say. I, I've been like, looking at the whole voting thing in the United States very closely. And dude, it is scary. It's scary. Like the, the attack surface area right now on the Dominion and, process, it is rigged to the core, brother. It is rigged. I, and also wow. understand in Canada, it doesn't like three parties that are the same thing right now. The liberals, the conservatives, and the NDP are the same party. There's no difference between so them. True. The conservative party let go of all of some of their core principle stances, and they've disenfranchised a lot of their voter base. The, P- the PPC, Max's party, it seems to be the only party that's like anti-lockdown, anti-tyranny. So that's positive. But at the end of the day, like, what, it's, what are we getting out of our vote? What look, are we look, getting look, 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 out of our vote? Bernier be able to participate in the national leaders debate? And do you think the criteria for this debate should be changed at all? No, and I've written a letter explaining how I do not believe he should be allowed. He's someone that is opposed science. (laughs) No Ah! science here. No (laughs) science here. We need to have a we need to have a a debate (laughs) that where we talk vaccine mandates as either like hard yes according to the liberals or like vaccines are great according to the conservatives but if you don't want to get the vaccine it's okay you just have to submit to hourly pcr testing because that's literally what they're saying who's saying no this is all bullshit it's not fucking deadly it's not killing people up right bodies aren't piling up on the streets we don't need to be doing this any longer we need to stop all these measures and the only person who's saying it on a political stage right now are people like maxine bernier Derek Sloan, Randy Hillier, and they're all being like criticized and ostracized as the lunatic fringe when in reality, their their like number of people who support those points are probably greater. They could very likely be greater than the number of people. Hey Kyle, how many people vote in Canada? What percentage of the adult population that can vote actually vote? I don't pull that stat up. I'm just saying, just take a number. What do you think? It's probably what? Do you really think it's 50%? I doubt it. (laughs) Like most people probably don't even vote. My point is everybody that never voted in the past, if that's 80% of Canada, if all those people just woke up and were like, yo, we need to make some moves here. To me, it just strikes me so, it's just like the system we have. Here we go. Ask and thou shalt. 2019, 66% of eligible registered voted voters voted. 66%. How many voted for Uncle Justin? Let's break it down. Look for more information. Let's see, if I just got so voter turnout. This is just going so just over over the years. Let me just share a screen here so we we can all see this. So over the years, this is voter turnout: 66, 68, 61, 58, 64, 60, 61. Okay. So okay, like not very high, and then. Wait, wait, wait. So you're saying six, so 60% of the eligible uh, population voted and of which 65% voted for Justin. No, this is just saying like that, that was 2019 Justin won with a minority, okay, okay. 2015 he which, won with though, a majority. He, but he has a minority. So meaning what does that mean in terms of, I wonder how many percentage, what percentage of the 60 actually voted. But what I'm trying to get at is it's, it's like a tiny minority of people that actually voted for him. It's not 80% of the people feel a certain way and blah, blah, blah. It's, it, usually it just, the game game works out in such a way that 15% of the population felt this guy was going to be our ruler. So he is. Yeah. Okay. Here we go. Here, here. All right. Here. I just pulled it up. This is the truth, Sonny. This is the truth. Like he won 33% of the seats wow. and this is based on the seats. So this is what, or no, this is actually, I guess that's the percentage of the vote. That's what yeah, I'm looking percentage for. Of, that's the percentage of the total vote. So like Max got one point. Bernie got 1.6, didn't get any seats. He won 33% and got 157 seats. Okay, wait, bro. What happened in Nova Scotia? Did you hear? Max won something. He won. He's like the majority. No, he didn't. You Google it. Nova Scotia, something happened with the PPC yesterday okay. or three days ago. Just look it up real quick. Because, okay, so what I'm trying to get at is this is like a big game, right? It seems. Now, what am I getting at? What am I getting? Okay, there's another thing I want to talk about. Maybe I'll save that one until we're finished talking about this political stuff here. But yeah, but I'd be interested in seeing your thought on, on Nova Scotia and what happened there. But I, I heard that there was something awesome happened. I don't see any. No news? 
Only pod. One. All right. And we are back, Kyle. So, so anyways, I was unable to find my Nova Scotia reference, but we'll, we'll leave that maybe for the next show. So let's go back to what we were talking about, right? So with regard to, you were saying that 60 some percent, 65 uh, percent of of the registered voters in Canada voted, voted, of which 30 some percent, I think you said, voted liberal. Is that correct? Yeah. Let me pull up the, pull up that. I have that here. Yeah. It was when 35% of the vote got the, the minority position. So he didn't know he had 33, sorry, 33%. And that was the 2019. Let's look. What did he get in the 2015? In the 2015, where he got a majority, he won 39% of the vote. So just to understand, 39%, and I think it was 68% turnout, 39%, this led to a liberal majority, meaning he had full control of the House of Commons, of a 68% is a whopping 26.5% of the registered voters voted. I want to know how many people are registered. Is that 10% of the Canadian population? Is it 90% of the Canadian population? Something in between, I assume. But that's a significant thing to know, I think. If you're trying to put this in context of 35 million Canadians, of which how many are even adults that that can vote, right? 20 some million, I don't know, 30 maybe max. Yeah, so let's see. Do some Googling here as well. How many... Adults live in Canada. <laughs> you gotta love this. 30 million. There you go. So what I'm trying to say is if you have 31, actually 31 million adults in Canada, when you say 66% of registered voters, how many people? So are- it was 66% of eligible reg- voters. At least, at least according to CBC, it was 66% of eligible voters. So and 66%? Which- What's 66% and- of this number? 30 million. So that's 20 million almost on the dot. So 20.4 million it, it, is it the was- registered. Okay. So out of that, what is it then? Out of the 20 million that's registered, you said 33% voted, right? So there are 27.1 million Canadians registered to vote and 17.9 oh. million cast ballots. Ballots. So how many? Uh, 17.9 million? 17.9 million of the 27.1 million. That's an interesting number. So 17, ultimately only 17.9. So let's say 18 million of the 31 million actually vote, right? Correct. Okay. So th- that's half. That's half, almost half. Huh? 68. It, yeah. It's, oh, it's 60. It's, no, it's basically half. You're right. You're right. It's basically half of mm-hmm. half of total. Un, un, understand too, total population of Canada is not all eligible voters. Any minor cannot vote. So that's why the, the numbers skewed down a little bit there. But it is, yeah. Very l- less to say. The key here mm-hmm. is, so let's just, let me just get you back front and center here. So the key thing here, our democracy is predicated on voters being able to engage in democratic processes. As it stands right now, the only real representation or real ability that we have to participate in our democracy, in our parliamentarian system, is every four years if it's a majority or every you know, maybe two or three years if it's a minority, we have a chance to go to the polls and to make one check mark on it, giving our vote to a person in that riding. And if that person is the majority winner in that riding of the votes, they get the position, they get the seat. And this means like that the the power that the, the parties who have the biggest footprint, they're able to win a majority government with 36% of the vote, of which is only representing 65%. In reality, he's like Justin and his crew can win with 26% of the Canadians voting, and they can have a majority government. Like how, and ultimately then the power that gets given and, and authorized to that party with such a small representation of the people's I, I is completely the, backwards. I just did the percentage on that. So 33% of 18 million is 6 million. So what I'm trying to say is, is so approximately 6 million people voted for Justin, no? Yeah, approximately. Well, he voted for Liberal Party. Party. Got it, got it, got it, got it. So what I'm trying to say is that, what's the population of Canada again? 30, you said 35 or no? I'm not, not sure what the current so, number so is. So right now I got 38 million. Okay, so... That means six divided by 38 is 
15. So 15% of the population of Canada determine the fate of the remaining 85% of us. Yeah. And there's so potentially there an, going- Of the other 85, if there was a unification of the 85, it would be like an elephant beside a fucking like a raccoon. It wouldn't really even stand a chance. Yeah. If there was a unified force trying to oppose, oppose these dictates and mandates, you saw the footage out of Montreal. Almost 200,000 people, somewhere between 100,000 and 200,000 people wow. came out I'm on a doing, Saturday. I'm doing this. I have the courage now to do this because of that, of stuff like that. When I see that the fellow Canadians are waking up at that scale, it's well, what? Because I was telling you this the other day. We both have kids. We both have, we both have kids. So like 20 years, right now, they're just kind of watching Paw Patrol and not really giving a shit. But, 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 but 20 years from now... When we're a little bit older, a little bit, maybe slower, maybe just on the rocking chair, chilling out. These guys are going to be like, yo, this is what went down when we were kids. Like, could you guys do, daddy? We right? sat at home and picked our nose. We hid. We hid under. We did weed. not. We are not. But yes, other <laughs> no, people. And this is, is what we we're saying. Say that no, of course. Tried. We did something. We put our reputation, our, our, our we, we're putting a lot at risk here. It might not be a nice conversation, but we know we're about to maybe potentially get banned. We're about to get marked as people that have a certain no. point. And it's scary to even talk about this stuff. This is the hardest, this is the most fun, but also hardest episode I've ever done because I know that we're even in the first 30 seconds of our conversation, we'd already violated everybody's terms and conditions. Well, uh, that's fine. That's why we're, that these, world, that's why these, that go world? on rumble and that's <laughs> yes. why we can we cast this out there we make it available and yes. and we also help help provide a message of like that that this system and just show that look this system is total bs it's not this is not democracy you have no you have no say in this you might think you're like you might think that representative truly represents you but it's Probably not that they don't actually represent it, but you think maybe if I vote for him, the party will best represent me. If you actually dug into it, it's quite unlikely that they truly represent you in that many ways. And why are we, why is, have we been reduced and all of our power removed from us as citizens, as, as, as involved citizens who should be able to exer- uh, exercise some civic like input into governance of Canada? And so this is where. This is like Buckminster Fuller said, don't try to fight the existing system. Build a new model that makes the existing system obsolete. And now, Sonny and I are coming to you, to whoever's listening to this, from a position of decentralization, of Mm. understanding Bitcoin and understanding crypto. And we know how this tech can work. And we see the bleeding edge examples of decentralized governance systems. And I know, and I've seen, I am, you could say, maybe consider a bit of a visionary in terms of understanding where tech can be, where it can go. I wrote a book called The Unified Wallet, Unlocking a Digital Golden Age, where we're understanding that we can get to an age and we can get to a point where we can share our inputs on where things go. And others, if you like what I'm saying, or if you like what Sonny is saying, you can give them your vote. You can delegate your vote on certain topics to that other person. And we can have a much more fluid democracy. And we can have many more referendums in society to start fixing this broken corporate like cesspool that has turned into this 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 toxic Canadian government system and this toxic public sector system. Like basically every single one of the systems is completely outdated using legacy tech. It's okay. full of it's full of okay. corruption. The big corporates have so much power and so much influence over over what takes place in government that it's no longer of the people by the people for the people of the institution by the institution for the institution and that is not that fundamentally is not Canada and free society is about let us return to these powers because in this age that we are at right now we have access to the most incredible tech all around us like we can do incredible things this can be a prosperous abundant planet and not one that is held prisoner under lockdown to medical tyranny tyrants 
global corporatic interests that do not give a sh about you or the people. They care about nothing other than control and power. And this is what happens with massive, massively centralized institutions. Over time, they get more and more powerful and more and more corrupt. This technology can take this pyramid that's been built and turn this pyramid upside down so that those at the top are subject to the will of the many and the oversight of the many so that we can have radical transparency, radical accountability, and radical responsibility in governance, in government systems. So that is where we can get to. Don't think that by casting a one vote once every three years, you have any power in this system. You do not. You have no power in this BS system with these BS parties who get 26% of the vote and get, get a mandate to do whatever the heck they like. So be and be afraid and question and not be afraid, be, be conscious of the situation. And let's look forward about what we can do and how we can build it together. And those are some of the things that we want to keep talking about. Okay. I was going to say, so a couple of things, 15%. So what did I say? 15% of these people dictate what we're all doing. Another number that I loved recently I heard is we like when you see these massive protests, like you said, the one in Montreal, the ones in, in France that you see every weekend, there's like, you know, Australia now, right? We outnumber them by a factor of 5,000 to one. So yes, there's a bunch of people that elect, but then ultimately there's a set of people that are there to run it and, and, and enforce it and all that. It's 5,000 to one. And that kind of, because it's like really scary when you think about speaking up against the powers to be and the government and blah, blah, blah. It's like, ah, you got to put it into perspective is these people, they think we give them our money, right? Like they, they are, they should be serving us, no? And if that's the case, should we not at least be able to question some of the basic things? What you said is it's so binary. You get to pick once every four years and then, and then you just blindly trust that hopefully they'll make all the right. Why can't I be making micro decisions? I don't need to make decisions on everything, but there are certain topics that are of interest to me that I may have expertise in that I, or just generally I want to opine on. Why can I not make any sort of, any votes on these types of decisions? I found that, I always, Always found that super weird. And I'm not going to lie, I just stayed away from it because like Bitcoin gave me this escape valve and I didn't need to focus on these kind of issues. But again, having learned a lot about what's going on in the United States and knowing that the Dominion voting systems and all these guys are all in our backyard, dude, they, their headquarters are in, in Toronto, <laughs> believe it or not. Right, so I feel very worried. And I'm just like, let's just say I, my attention now is on these bigger problems. And like you said, how do we take the technology that Satoshi and Bitcoin brought to the world and apply it to things like voting and micro voting. And okay. So a couple of things I want to talk about. Oh, there's a bunch of things I want to talk about. Okay. By the way, are you pressed for time? Do you have to run right now? Or do you have a little bit longer? Or... I've got a little bit longer. This guy, uh... Sweden, Canada. <laughs> so we're just getting warmed up. So I want to talk a little bit about the pink elephants in the room, right? Chris guy has woken people up in a big way. Who is he? This message of unified non-compliance. I don't think it's the answer, right? Like the final answer, but I do feel like it's part of the answer. And, and so I, I, I don't know. I'm interested yeah. in, interested just in what he's say, doing. J just say no. Just Lovely. say no Wait, to all this, this drug this, campaigns back in the eighties. <laughs> basically. <laughs> and Chris yeah. is now, he's a, he's an international celebrity. Of, he's a gym of, bro of, that had the prophetic, what is it? Like 60 seconds in front of uh, Eaton center where he's lit. You want to, we, can we do some screen sharing action? Cause that would be cool. I first learned about Chris sky when it was, when the mandatory hotels came onto the scene. And he mm. came back into Canada. He was like, no, no way. This is against section 14.1 of the quarantine act and 8.1 of the charter rights. No, I'm not doing that. And if you don't let me out of here, I'm going to call the police and have you arrested police officer. And then he walked right out of there and he began telling everybody the instructions for how that they can, how, why they should just say no and not be subject to this tyranny of going and subjecting yourself at your own cost to being incarcerated, like some sort of poisonous toxic human that you might be so that was when chris guy and then since then he's been helping others and has been a little bit of a beacon of light for standing up and standing and just saying no and he wrote the book just say no a guide to freedom and now united non-compliance and and he's not like he's not well loved by politicians on any side, including the PPC. But he is he is standing up strong and hit play. Let's listen to Chris Guy. Because they know Canadians are 
Koreans like to do it, they're told. So they tell you you have to wear them. Next, they're going to tell you you have to contact trace. Then they're going to tell you you have to take the vaccine. And because Canadians like to do it, they're told, they're hoping that everyone just complies. And then guess what, kids? Once you take your vaccine, like a dumb person that doesn't know any better, they're going to tell you, sorry, the vaccine isn't as effective as we thought it was going to be. So now you still got to wear a mask, still got to get contact trace, still have all the restrictions and social distancing, and still take your vaccine. And then what did you get out of all? You got a whole year where you weren't allowed to travel. Your business was closed. They took your rights and freedoms. They forced the vaccine on and the same amount of people died. Everything is the exact same. And now they're going to put you back on lockdown and bring it all the way till July of next year so they can do the same thing again. Bring you from July, August, and September, getting you off lockdown, but just to bring you back on lockdown again. If you haven't figured it out yet, it's a perpetual cycle that you never get out of. And it's a way to take your rights, your freedoms, close your business, take your wealth. Why? So you become dependent on government. Why? If you're independent, the government works for you like it's supposed to. If you depend on the government to give you a paycheck to feed your family every month because they closed your business on you, now the government doesn't work for you. The government rules you. So instead of a middle class, we have the government, upper class, and the lower class dependents that rely on the government to survive. In other words, we have a slave class. And that's what they're trying to do. It's that's Wow. Fuck. And that was a year ago, not last week. A year ago, he's been telling people, warning people about this. So, Chris, I pay is that he looks like a dangerous right wing extremist conspiracy theory nut bar, Sonny. Of course, he is. Of course, he is. Yeah, and exactly. And like this spell <laughs> and they attack and they slander. Hey, King, anti masker, anti vaxxer, all these, all these, these attacks, these side attacks, these bullshit. And he is literally thesis, standing his thesis, up. His thesis is that you can't beat the system from within the system. And I'm seeing all the tyranny in full blown mode it is a bit hard to argue against that point that that you've well, got to just like like i said there's 85 percent, 90 percent, maybe even way more due to the of the 15 percent. i'm not gonna lie people like me even i could have gotten suckered into that whole narrative oh he's gonna legalize this and that and hey great but dude i think a lot of people, like a, over the last year and a half and, I, and here's the thing people like me truth be told my life wasn't negatively impacted over the last year and a half and the fact that i'm going out there and even speaking and trying to talk about this stuff is a bit weird but i i do see what's happening to people around me and i also feel like if i don't speak up then it's it, they're coming after all of us it's not just we can just sit back and see all these like mom and pop businesses get shut down left right and center and just be like oh whatever it's okay and especially when you're woke and you're or not woke in that sense but like you're awake to the fact that what's actually going on in the world when you look at the statistics and you look at the numbers and you look at it's just too much. Okay, Chris Guy. So I, I'm glad we touched on that. Another thing, Sweden. I don't know if we want to talk about that, but like, was it Sweden or Switzerland that you you talk about in terms of the Swiss? Switzerland. Right? You talk about the Swiss. So uh, I, maybe maybe that's another one for another episode. But I always thought what you talked about there was the Swiss are just generally there's just so many cool things about them, right? But what? Yeah, is there anything you want to talk about it? I know you also have a company. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, let's just talk just really quickly. So in Switzerland, there is direct democracy democracy in the form that any Swiss citizen can go out, like raise, if they get a 100,000 signatures on like referendum paper, it triggers a referendum. Every year, there are four votes that happen. I believe it's four votes that happen. And when the whole population go out and vote on the referendums, if I think it's if it's the majority, I'm not sure the exact threshold, but if a certain portion of the population votes for a measure, it becomes the law. If you've got an issue in Switzerland with something that doesn't make sense, you convince or you get 100,000 people to sign up saying that this doesn't make sense and then it goes to vote and then you present your case if you're the referendum seeker you present your argument the government presents its argument everybody before the election gets a book with both sides of the argument saying this is the pro argument this is the against argument. And then you go and you vote and you actually have four times a year the opportunity to go vote on a myriad of issues. And like this enables participation within it. 
You don't have that ability. If 100% of Canadians were like, oh, income tax equals slavery, and then they were able to see the actual argument against income tax versus the government's argument, okay, government, give us your argument for income tax, and we'll give you an argument against income tax and the solution that will lead to way more revenue for the government and Canada without putting this ridiculous burden on the individual, a liability for tomorrow. You're always going to be a slave underneath income tax, and we can break that. And so if Canada were to say, let's eliminate that and all like in, in the radical position where you're never going to get the radical because there's some people that want to keep that, they want to hold on to that power. But let's say 90% of Canadians support it. And okay, it's supported. It's law. Boom. Done. We change the system. If we move forward in this new direction and we, uh, there needs to be that mechanism. And right now it's like, what happens is like, I'm on the liberal list. I get these emails and it's, give us your great ideas and give us your great ideas. And you could have a chance to win a zoom call with Justin. <laughs> that's how we be earn our, that's how we participate is by giving you all of the great ideas. No, thank you. And, who, and uh, do you know who uh, principles Ray, da Ray Dalio is? I know the name. He's like the best hedge fund manager ever. Um, he wrote a book called Principles. And he explains in there how he's developed this like this system that it's so beautiful. But it's like, so in a meeting, right? In his office, there's 50 people. They'll bring up certain topics and everybody has an iPad and they'll be like kind of answering where they sit on certain positions in real time. And this like, this uh, system that they've built has the ability to, you know, remember. So for example, if you're scoring high, like you make a bunch of predictions and you're doing better, now you, your answers in the future get weighted accordingly. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like meritocracy. <laughs> like it's missed. Totally. <laughs> but I'm saying you could, like the free market has a lot of technology and tools that we, you talked about Bitcoin. There's all these ways that we could just well, do better. And it, there's just no desire to even do, but you could just, you, you could. Dude. Okay. So I, I like that. And these are all like just little teasers that we're throwing out there. We, we, we could literally, every topic we talked about, we could spend two hours, three hours going off on and we're going to, but I, I wanted to touch on these and it, it's just, we don't take up your whole night or whatever. I, I want to end on this Canada note that you obviously brought up. And I think it's in line with leaving people with that. We're not just here, a bunch of guys complaining about shit where we've got some interesting ideas and some of them may stick, some of them may not. But for me, it's all about just having ideas and, and then trying to see what makes sense and what doesn't and connecting with others about them. And so moving forward, we're going to interview people like Addison, like I said, lawyers, we're going to bring on activists and doctors and blah, and a lot of it's just going to be Kyle and I just chatting. But do you want to talk about, I don't know, one of these brain? Yeah, well, I wouldn't call it a brain fart. It's like we're, <laughs> we're actively trying to figure out, okay, understanding based on the facts that you only get to vote once every two to four years. Mm -hmm. You're entire exercising of democracy is one check, maybe two on a piece of paper. And that is democracy. And then a, a party can win 26% of the eligible voter population and get a majority government and free reign to to enact laws on behalf on, in a majority fashion. That is Kyle, I, 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 one. All right. All right. Okay. Okay. We're back. Sorry about that. Yeah, go ahead. Canada. Okay, so the point was we're not exercising any form of democracy in Canada anymore, and the like trying to fight or trying to fight this existing system or make it so that we elect a bunch of representatives who might fit our worldview to go and take power into it and doesn't solve anything because we're still just making the one check mark on the box. We need true. We need to build a new system that makes it better. So. In the field of crypto, there's this emergent structure called the DAO, the Decentralized Autonomous Organization, the DAO. And Sonny and I have been discussing, and I've been looking into this and looking at DAO structures. There is a great example called Gitcoin that is a DAO for funding open source development. Open source developments were responsible for $500 billion worth of value each year, and it receives very little funding. So these guys created a DAO to help fund that. Now, the principle behind a DAO could be correlated and utilized in replacing parliament, in replacing elected officials, in replacing parties entirely, so that 
we as individuals can vote on all the issues. So if you want to vote on all those issues that these guys vote on, and of which many people are diametrically opposed to it, and in parliament, they have something called the whip too, where you must vote the party way. Like you don't have any choice, even if your constituents completely disagree with it, you must vote for the party's way. So we need to break that and start enabling the people to have direct input on it. And as well, the, this notion of delegation, of delegating your responsibility. Ka, 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 but it, and if I'm not mistaken, like, I mean, again, I'm not a genius. I don't know this stuff that well, but I assume that the reason they did this is because they didn't have technology back in the day. Like it wasn't practical for people to put their input. You had to just pick some no, guy. This is, this is pre-cell phone. This is pre-SMS. This is pre, <laughs> this is pre, this was like telephone was just coming around <laughs> when, when the constructs, and this goes even back longer, like the history of the parliament. Like I'm not a historian, but it's, it's this is centuries old. And really? This predates the technology that way. But now with cell phones, geez, we have a magic wand here. It can, we can, I can call China in two seconds and be connected with somebody. I can yeah. send money instantly to, to anywhere in the world. I can in, like a dog post on Facebook. Why can't I freaking make a decision exactly. that impacts I, my neighborhood? I, Exactly, exactly. So <laughs> let's utilize this technology. Let's reframe the, the, let's understand what the purpose of this system was and recognize that the current system does not support the purpose in any form or fashion anymore. So we need a new system moving forward. And this is what I would propose is the code name, the Canada or the Canada Dow. And this is a way like from at a federal level that we can enable all Canadians, all eligible voters to be able to participate in every single vote and also to put forth things to be voted on. And there can be just like with the Swiss, you need 100,000 signatures. You need X number of people to agree towards a proposal and then it goes to vote at the larger community. And then there's the ability as well for you to delegate your vote on certain categories to individuals. So you might like you might like Sunny for Bitcoin. You might like you might like Justin for teaching. You might like any number. You might like uh, no, no, that's, yeah. a, that's a cheap shot, but like uh, Kevin O'Leary for business, or you might like any ways like you get deeper and you can assign you can delegate that vote. And then at any time as well, you can unassign that vote too. So if somebody compromises, like votes on something you don't believe in, you can un you can take it back. And also every vote is totally transparent, totally viewable. Yeah, I like, say that, yeah. Or, like it should be. Absolutely. Right? And also, and same with the spending. So when there's spending associated to this, there can be the treasury. Thank and you. when a vote happens that for spending, the money get, will get then sent to this person or this groups of people or all these different like receivers will receive it and it's radically transparent to see who it's all going to and then there can be reporting functions and everything into it but at the goal like i'm not suggesting that we everything needs to change although i will say that everything need does need an upgrade to these this Dow philosophy, the same as like the federal, the same should happen at the provincial level. The same should happen at the municipal level. Like you want to talk about poor turnout, look at a city election, look at a municipal election. My goodness, that has like those elections actually carry a lot of power. The decisions that, that the mayors and the councillors and the superintendents make, they're very powerful. And oftentimes those are like less than 50% turnout. And and, and there's huge influence towards the decision-making that ultimately happens in that. So again, like that Dow construct could be applied to Toronto. It could be applied to Mississauga. It could be applied to a neighborhood within Mississauga. It could be applied to a school board. It could be applied to a health board. It can be applied to like government agency. It can be applied to many different things. This at idea the core. called the Dow is our terminology, but you said direct democracy. You said, democracy. yeah, this is di direct democracy, <laughs> liquid democracy, liquid or democracy, delegative right. Democracy. Right, right. You mentioned mm -hmm. another term, meritocracy. Mm -hmm. These are like there are these emergent kind of models which are made possible with technology. And it's time. And it's hey, time. Uh, we live in an era. Freaking Salvador has made Bitcoin legal tender. Like I I'm not gonna. I'm the probably the biggest Bitcoin guy ever. But I did not think that this El Salvador thing would have happened. So maybe there's an opportunity for for Canada to consider things like that. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. The money like, system is definitely absolutely, you know, kind of absolutely, and 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 in a in 
a, a referendum style liquid direct democracy, there's the ability for you know someone to propose something like, okay, let's start a Canada coin and let's make it an actually a public blockchain that has mm. direct ties towards like tangible assets, resource, etc. Not some sort of BS CBDC that's a private mm. network that can be censored and can be like can be used as a further tool of control, but actually mm. a public chain, a public token. And then mixed with that can be a larger undertaking collaborative creative process towards thinking, okay, once we have an open public Canada coin, then let's work with all the payment processors, for example. Like I'm sure every Canadian knows taxes. I was familiar with sales taxes, HST in Ontario, QST in Quebec, GST, the federal tax. They took a step in Ontario. We had GST and PST, and they harmonized it into HST. It's too damn complicated to have these two taxes and these two reporting and do that. So they made it into one. And then if we want to, I'll just take a quick second to explain. If I'm a business and it costs me $100 to make a product, and I sell that product. So when I make, it costs me hundred dollars to make the product. I spend $15 in taxes to make that product. If I sell the product for $200, I collect $30 in taxes as the sales tax. As the business, I then get to write the $15 off against the $30 and net I pay $15 into back to the government. And that's the way it works. And it means as well that you as the business have to actually hold on and collect the money and then remit it at some later date. So it puts liability, it puts an obligation on you to act as a tax collector and a tax remitter. Otherwise, you're not in compliance. Now, with digital currency and with an open Canada dollar, for example, we could make it so on spending instantly. I'm the business. I, I, I sold my thing for $200. I get $200. That's it. Like I paid $100 to make it. I paid $100. That's it. The tax money instantly went into the appropriate coffers and it doesn't need to go into big basket coffers. It could go into Dow coffers for various things, but it could also go directly to the inputs. If you've ever filled up on gas at the gas station, there's a little pie chart that says, where does your gas dollar, where does, where does all the money from the gas go? And it like shows like the retailer makes a tiny little amount of money and there's like all these taxes that go else, elsewhere. But ultimately, they collect it and goes through the system, but with a, with a smart, open public currency, it's possible that those that money gets remitted instantly, which will actually reduce the price of it because that that overhead in just facilitating I, that. Going, I have a question for you. Why do you need tax in the first place? To do what? Build the roads? To teach the children? To, to do build the roads? To, to, sure, to build the roads? To police officers? Okay, so that's the fundamental teach, thing, right? Sure. To, I want to propose a counter narrative. So I watched public the good. Patrol public good i watched the paw patrol the movie amazing movie with my kids yesterday amazing movie the whole movie is about these paw patrol these five or six pups that go and one of them's a police right chase one of them's a firefighter one of them is like a concrete pourer and can make shit one of them so there's five you know they've got these different kind of angles but they're all doing public good in one part of the one part of the movie they go up this like they have this new like headquarter and it's like the biggest building in in the entire city and they get up and they turn to rider riders like the kid that's their like guide their leader or whatever not really the leader but the guide he's they turn up to him they go like how can we afford all this stuff he's, what do you mean we sell merch he pulls up a shirt and he's we sell merch and he's like it's, they're selling like hotcakes and i almost cried when i saw that <laughs> i almost cried when i saw that what okay the, just it, the inherent do you remember the the cops show back in the day bad boys but was it remember where they don't do and they'd have these follow cops around that show is so hot if the police could somehow if they're carrying cams anyways that shit that they're going through is so intense that if they just had a way to like i said monetize and sell merch where police could just be seen as these like superheroes of our society which they are by the way when i see the police nowadays i literally pull over i'm like yo thank you like with my kids and stuff like you're doing amazing work but i'm just saying is 
I'm not going to lie. And, and again, all this stuff is stuff that we, we're going to talk about in this show more. But this idea of, I, I believe in something called the non-aggression principle, which is that like, if you don't aggress upon me, I'm not allowed to like hit you. I love martial arts. I watch UFC. I'm all about the fighting life, but I don't want to, I don't want to ever, you know, force myself upon someone unless I'm literally trying to defend myself or someone around me. So what I'm trying to say is when I just hear the word tax, I think of force because I think of that business owner, let's say, forget, okay, we abolish income tax, which I totally agree with. I pay my taxes, by the way, I hire freaking awesome accountants, make sure so I never don't, but I pay it. Why? Because I'm scared. Not because I think it's actually doing good. I don't think it's doing good. I actually, I think there's way better ways of spending that money, but I do it out of fear. So what I'm getting at is that even this other tax, oh, it's 10%, it's only, but it's still this thing that we're just taking from people. What if we could just sell merch? What if firefighters literally just, what if we could support these things through private initiatives and efforts? Because guess what? My iPhone, my computers, this is how everything is just the free market people. When you just let them solve problems, they do. Right. I mean, why do we have to put it? Like, there's ah. like, we only need so much merch, to be honest, is, is one thing. We don't want to just, think, <laughs> we, don't want to, we don't want to encourage radical hyper materialism <laughs> in the name of that. But it's look like the, the Statue of Liberty that was like crowdfunded by the people of France. They sold little tiny figurines that went towards that gift in the Statue of Liberty. You know, understand again, there are times when there is a purpose to having a community fund towards doing communal good. And that can be both at the municipal level, it can be like the neighborhood level, the municipal level, the school level, there is a purpose towards having some taxes, maybe it's maybe you want to opt in to these taxes. Maybe it's, it's like when you go to the store, would you like to add a dollar to your bill for, for the kids or for the pollution or for the world or for the cars or for the oil industry, like whatever you want. There, there could be that option, but I think as well, like we aren't in a consumptive world. And if we want to have, if we want, like you said, the schools, if we want to have, the again, schools, schools, I know, right? and, and the kids... schools are terrible. And the schools, they're not terrible, but they're like, there's it's terrible. When I think about it, it's weird, icky feeling. Like just, you put 30 kids, they face one direction. We tasked this like one lady or this man to, and oh. in these little boxes. And, was, gotta, and that was pre-COVID, like, bro. That was pre-COVID. Yes. Now COVID, now in this, this dystopic school system, they literally got plexiglass during masks for eight hours a day. Oh, I can't I say can't strong enough. That's yeah. absolutely disgusting. It's, it's child so, abuse. So How are you supposed to learn from I a can't. teacher who's wearing a mask? Are you kidding me? You can't, you can't see. How am I supposed to learn English from forget, someone who can forget cover the thing. Forget. They can't breathe. They can't breathe. It's child abuse. It's child abuse, plain and simple. And the education thing, we're both parents. We're yeah, going to save this. We're, we're going to save this one. We're going to save this one for a later discussion because it's a, it's okay. A There's a lot of discussion. topics, a lot of topics. So as people can see, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to go where nobody goes. <laughs> I don't think anyone's talking about this shit. I go on YouTube all day. I go everywhere. No one's talking about this. And you're right. It'll probably be a rumble or whatever. Odyssey. We'll figure out some ways to get it out there. But anyways, dude, I, I want to keep doing this, Kyle. I, I think it's a necessity. I think people are, are looking for others. to. I think a lot of people are feeling what we're, we're talking about. Maybe not all of it, but for certain parts of it. And Dude, if people don't speak up, then like I said, 20 years from now, if we're all like living in boxes and like you said, like it's this totally like tyrannical totalitarian world takes over and what you and I are seeing might happen. I'm not going to be able to live with myself. So it's, it's, yeah. it's a matter. Of, and, and nowadays, like I said, it's not about guns and bombs. It's about information. It's about a camera. It's about the internet. It's about Bitcoin. It's about empowering people. It's about house. Like, look, all this stuff is all on the table. It's all on the table. And so this is a call out. We're calling out the peeps to, to come together, man. I think there's a lot of interesting topics. Maybe we'll get guys like Chris Sky on the show and Max Bernier or whatever the name, the name is. We'll try and get these guys on there, man. I don't think they're all humans. And once we start creating and putting our intention out there, Kyle, I, I feel that like magical things are going to happen. And it's not for me. I can't just sit around and talk about you shot 256 and blah, blah, blah. We've got to talk about things that actually matter right now. And I totally agree, Sonny. This shit that's going down. Okay, brother, this is going to be, I think, a two hour episode. So I'm going to let's bring this one out close. Go spend some time with your family. I'm going to do the same. And then, yeah, if, tomorrow, even if you want to do another episode, I'm game. Yeah. So let's get this going. Okay. And whoever listens to this, thank you for your attention. I'm sorry if we if I've said anything that uh, hurts you, you take personally, and please forgive me. And I'm really thankful that you've tuned in and are listening, just to everybody. And also know that I really do, I do love you, and I do hold love and space for all. And go 
those four lines, Ho'oponopono, that can lead to great healing. So if you're out there and you're having challenges with other people, you might have some like family divisions right now, because I know a lot of people are divided, and the friends, old time friends are, are divided. Just know that you can say these four words, these four lines. I'm sorry, please forgive me, I am thankful, I love you. By saying those, you can really start healing the wounds of the past so that you can move past those wounds and start moving forward. So I use this as well to my brother Justin. I'm sorry, I love you, I'm thankful, please forgive me. Thank you, son. That was beautiful. Okay, let's let's maybe bring this one to an end, Kyle, and then we'll recon- reconvene shortly. <laughs> let's do the doge salute to, to cap this what's, off. What's the doge salute? The Doge salute. So bring your hands to heart center. Heart center, that's called Namaste in our language. And then hand up to the sky. What? And then hug the earth and bring it all the way down. And then back to heart center and then pointing to the moon. And then with your left arm, throw it out to the far side, reach as far as you can. And then bring in the D, make a magnet. It gets connected. And then with your thumb, First time. Here. You cross your paws. Well done. Okay, dude. Awesome. Okay, that's good, Kyle. Bye, Sunny. Bye, everybody.